on April 23, 2020, I uploaded my very first Zelda related video on this channel, which means that we have recently surpassed the one year mark. Though the channel has existed for longer than that, I honestly don't even remember what I was using it for prior to that. Maybe for Smash Brothers replays or music playlists. I really don't know. I've been doing corporate animations for a number of years, and my quote unquote YouTube career kicked off when I was brought on board as an editor for the Commonwealth Realm, where I had been editing Zelda videos on a weekly basis for around 8 months or so. Then as Covid made its presence known around the world, a lot of corporate projects got delayed or outright cancelled, and I was suddenly left with a lot more free time than usual. Instead of just hanging back and waiting for new jobs to eventually return, I figured this would be a great opportunity to do something I've been wanting to do for a while starting my own YouTube channel. Since then, the channel has grown at a rate which exceeded my wildest expectations. I sometimes come across comments who say my channel is underrated, or that I need more subs, and that is honestly very heartwarming to read. But at the same time, 60k subscribers in one year doesn't feel underrated to me. In fact, it is more than I would ever think was possible in such a short time, especially since I didn't really have like a plan or a business strategy for my channel. I just wanted to make Zelda videos, and so I did. And here we are today. Day, still making Zelda videos on a weekly basis with the same passion as when I started. Since my very first video was all about dungeons, it seems fitting to celebrate this anniversary with another dungeon video. But not just any dungeon video, your dungeon video. For this special occasion I've asked you, the viewers, to submit your unique ideas for a future Zelda dungeon. Now there were a lot of submissions, way more than I expected, and I was pleasantly surprised by the creativity and imagination you guys have. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, I had to narrow it down to a reasonable number. I would have loved to include every single one of your ideas, but that would stretch this video beyond my limit. I did manage to include more people into the video, since there were quite a lot of overlapping and complementary ideas. As such, I decided to combine some of these concepts together into one general dungeon idea. If I somehow overlooked your idea, or you had a similar idea but you weren't included, I apologize. There was a lot to go over, and even though I feel like I've read every single one of them, it's always possible that some manage to slip through. I also want to reiterate that if your idea didn't make it in, please don't take it personal. I appreciate each and every one of you equally and there's always a next time. One last thing to mention is that for this list, I've been working together with an amazing artist, who is none other than Ganon Doodles. They've been doing some great work for other creators in the past, and for this video they've been kind enough to help realize some of your ideas by creating concept art. So I hope you enjoy that little extra touch. But let's not delay any any further, here are 25 dungeon concepts brought forth by the Zelda community. So far the Zelda series has included dungeons based on a lot of different architectural styles, but never before have we explored one based solely on feudal Japan. The closest we've gotten was the Yiga clan hideout, though I'm hard pressed to call this a dungeon. Thus the idea of a Japanese style house or mansion is very alluring. David Bernard, Aidan Cogswell and the teacher all weighed in on this idea. David suggests a Japanese house deep inside a forest, with sliding doors, secret rooms, scotillas and ghost type enemies. The best comparison I can think of in recent times would be Shogun Studios in Paper Mario The Origami King. An imposing Asian style castle filled with these types of sliding doors, secrets and booby traps David is referring to, but of course in the style of Zelda instead. Aiden Cogswell says this could be a Sheikah dungeon, but not like the ancient technology themed ones akin to the shrines in the Divine Beasts, but more so based on the modern day Sheikah we encounter in Kakariko Village, which are heavily based on Japanese culture, both in terms of their architecture as well as their fashion. The teacher also thinks it's about high time we get another dungeon based on a mansion, a bit like Snow Peak Ruins from Twilight Princess, and most importantly, bring back the soup. Asian soup, this time. As for a possible boss idea, David's got you covered. He suggests that the boss of the dungeon would be the owner of the house, a woman dressed in a kimono, who appears friendly at first but ends up transforming into a monster at the end. The idea of the boss appearing as a normal friendly entity at first is of course very reminiscent of Yetta, who comes off as sweet and innocent at first and then ends up transforming into Blizzetta due to the influence of the Mirror of Twilight.
Next on the list we have a dungeon in the form of a town or village. Very fitting with the recent release of Resident Evil Village. Instead of an enclosed indoor space as is normally the case with Zelda dungeons, this town or village would be out in the open of course. The closest we've come to this idea in the 3D games was probably the city in the sky. Though to be honest, even though it has the word city in its name, it doesn't really feel like it. What we would be looking at here is a real proper town with many houses and other types of buildings to explore. Add in Carme, Jeffrey, Time Agent Y, Camille and Rins Miguel's all sketch a similar idea. A secluded town with a mystery attached to it. As such, a dungeon like this would be more focused on one giant puzzle to figure out. Perhaps, as Jeffrey states, the town could be haunted or cursed, and Link has to find the source of this mystery by solving puzzles and basically playing detective. This whole endeavor could then lead up to a boss fight on the town square or something like that. The closest we've come to something like this would be the Village of the Blue Maiden stage in Four Swords Adventures, which is about solving a mystery surrounding the villagers being spirited away by an unknown force, but I think this idea could be expanded upon and translated into a 3D environment. It would definitely make for a unique dungeon experience. If there is one thing that brings true tension to a video game, it is an enemy that is so strong and dangerous that fighting it head on would be a death sentence. And misled Chip, Soso Chan and Axicon all seem to dig this concept. We've seen this idea used in other games in the past, like Resident Evil's Mr. X, The Evil Within, Silent Hill 2 and more recently Half-Life Alex in the infamous chapter named Jeff. An enemy who is so powerful and dangerous that running and hiding is the only way to go until you find a way to defeat the monstrosity once and for all. Some may shiver at the thought of this concept as it can be very stressful, but I personally love this idea because it creates a relationship between the player and the boss. Instead of just a random monster who pops up at the very end as is tradition with the Zelda series, the entire dungeon is the boss fight in a sense. This would also be a great way to have the main dungeon item hidden away at the very end of the dungeon, and one which finally makes it possible to defeat the boss who's been stalking you mercilessly up to that point. We've only gotten a small taste of this idea in a Zelda game, like the Wallmaster who keeps following you from room to room trying to take back the orb Link is trying to steal. This part genuinely gave me anxiety at the time, if only for the ominous music and the feeling of being chased constantly. However, Link is never actually in danger himself. There's also the central chamber on Lome Labyrinth Island in Breath of the Wild. Here a guardian stalker patrols the area and if you were still in the early stages of the game, that is to say a small health bar and weak armor like I had when I first visited here, this mechanized giant can give you quite the spook as it creeps around the corners of these hallways. Now imagine that but with better AI and scripted encounters, and you got yourself one tense dungeon experience. This one kinda speaks for itself, a dungeon shaped like a giant tower. For some reason there were quite a lot of suggestions which all mentioned a clock tower specifically. Think TikTok clock from Mario 64, but in a Zelda game. I've talked about a tower dungeon before in my first two videos and even modeled one as a demonstration, but whereas mine was just an abstract construction with little rhyme or reason, it would of course be more interesting if there was an actual theme to it, like a clock tower, as Meeg, Jay and Throck Durloy suggested. Joan Crew suggested something similar. Similar, but in this case it's a Rido tower with wind as its main theme and mechanic. Shadow Gale proposes that each floor could have a different element or its own unique enemies. Michelle mentions a dragon atop the tower acting as the final boss, which would be a great callback to Twilight Princess, and Ashton describes a huge cylinder shaped tower of which its floors can be rotated. Whether it's a clock tower, an ancient Rito tower or a more abstract giant cylinder, the idea of descending upwards further and further until you reach dazzling heights has always been very appealing to me, especially since the punch punishment of falling down can be unforgiving, and with Breath of the Wild's open air design philosophy, climbing and paragliding, this can turn into an absolute banger of a dungeon. Dimension shifting is nothing new to the Zelda franchise. We've been doing it since all the way back in A Link to the Past, but this has usually been reserved for the overworld and not inside an actual dungeon. In A Link to the Past, using the magic mirror inside the dungeon simply sends you back to the entrance. We have seen the games toying around with the idea of traversing the dungeon in two different time periods, like in Oracle of Ages and of course more famously the sand ship in Skyward Sword, but aside from some small changes in the aesthetics of the dungeon, it was still just the same place, just in a different state of time. 
time. Some doors would be accessible in one and blocked in another, or a certain device or switch would only work in one or the other. Troubadouring Do wants to take it a step further. Instead of simple time travel, this dungeon idea would incorporate different mirrored worlds we can shift between. These parallel dimensions would have a lot more differences than just some visual changes. It would be cool to see two vastly different worlds, but which are still connected and where one can still affect the other. Think of the normal world and the nether in Minecraft as an example. Both could have completely different enemies, atmospheres and puzzles to solve. The first thing that came to my mind while reading this idea was Silent Hill Origins, where the player can use mirrors to transport themselves between two different dimensions, a light world and a dark nightmare world, though here the two worlds are still pretty similar. Speaking of mirrors, Abby Normal complements this concept and presents the idea of a Medusa type boss, who would be made vulnerable by utilizing mirrors to expose its weaknesses. Zelda dungeons have historically been tied to all sorts of different elements. From forest to fire, ice and water, the list goes on. But what if we had one dungeon that centers around different biomes as Kalake Melee suggests? A culmination of many different elements and weather types, kind of like the first stage of Ganon's Tower in Ocarina of Time, but taken to the extreme. We've also seen this concept used in the Trial of the Sword to a certain extent, where rooms had different elements and even different weather in some cases like rain, lightning and snow. But that wasn't really a dungeon. It was completely linear and centered around combat alone. Imagine if you built an entire dungeon around these biomes. Not just combat, but puzzles, mini-bosses and even a final boss as well. Say you need to melt ice in one area by bringing something hot like a smoldering rock from another, or carry ice or water back to a desert area to solve a puzzle there. Legend Beast and Koloan Simons add to this idea by proposing a mechanic which allows us to shift between seasons or different weather types. Again, something we've already seen in Oracle of Seasons, but only in the overworld and never inside an actual dungeon. Playing around with elements is cool and could provide some amazing puzzles. This whole idea of different biomes also makes me think back to Luigi's Mansion 3, where each floor of the hotel was a unique environment, and in some cases with different climates as well. A dungeon which, in and of itself, lies in a different dimension is always welcome in my book. We've seen this with the Palace of Twilight in Twilight Princess, and to a very small extent the Spirit Realm in Skyward Sword. But in Skyward Sword these were just small fetch quests with a slightly more foggy, glowing version of the overworld, and not an actual dungeon, so to speak. And in the case of the Palace of Twilight, this is a place which Link actually physically visits by traveling through the Twilight Portal. However, iBoss presents the idea of Link instead astral projecting himself into another world while his actual body stays behind. A bit similar to how Link's spirit was trapped inside the Sacred Realm in Ocarina of Time. And, well, speaking of the Sacred Realm, Anna Lovescrafts, Ruber Kofob 124, Obi's Mongies and Titanfall 64 all came up with the similar idea of a dungeon inside the Sacred Realm. More specifically, the Temple of Light. The Temple of Light was built by the Light Sage Raru to hide the Triforce. But as far as we know, the Triforce has not resided in the Sacred Realm ever since Ocarina of Time, and the traditional six sages haven't been seen since Twilight Princess. Perhaps the temple could have been tainted or corrupted since then. We never actually see much of the Temple of Light other than the Chamber of Sages, a surreal, dreamlike room Link would visit each time he cleared one of Ocarina's temples. It would be amazing to see more of the Temple of Light, and the idea of Link visiting this place in spirit form rather than his physical body would also present all sorts of new ideas for puzzles and themes. Since, as we saw in Breath of the Wild, spirits seem to abide by slightly different rules of physics. They can float and manifest and such, so I definitely see some cool possibilities. If you're familiar with the lore of Skyward Sword, you know that the Master Sword is not just an object used to kill Ganondorf. There are, in fact, two different entities who house themselves inside the legendary blade. That being Link's former companion, Fai, and the source of reincarnating evil, the Demon King Demise. Now, we don't know for sure if this cycle will ever be broken. Some suggest that since Ganondorf will likely play a key role in Breath of the Wild 2, perhaps now is the time to finally break the cycle once and for all. Whether or not this will actually be the case remains to be seen. But if if there's one way to do it, what would be more awesome than a dungeon inside the Master Sword? An idea which Isaac Yutzi and Annie Stone suggested. 
If this would be the case, this would likely be the final dungeon of the game. Instead of the typical Ganon's lair or Ganon's tower, we would have to travel inside the sword itself to face Demise and break his curse. A dungeon like this could be themed after the conflict of light and dark, since Fi and Demise both represent the opposite of the spectrum. It would also be cool to see Fi in the flesh again, as long as she shuts up about the batteries in my Joy-Cons. Okay, so imagine the Hyrule Castle section from Twilight Princess. You know, the part where Wolf Link is being held prisoner after having been taken away by one of the Shadow Beasts. Now imagine that, but instead of breaking free just like that and being on your way, Link is imprisoned and has to slowly find his way out, and face whoever put him there in the first place. This is the idea that Johnny Peacock, Ravio, the Triforce films and Daniel LaHaye all propose. Prison Break Zelda. I love me some prison escape movies, and the idea of playing this out in the form of a Zelda dungeon? Count me in. Since he's a prisoner, it goes without saying that he would have been stripped of all of his equipment and weapons, which is a great way of having him start from scratch within the confines of a dungeon environment. It's also a great callback to the Forsaken Fortress, where Link is left vulnerable without a sword and has to sneak his way across for the majority of the time spent there. There are no video game-esque puzzles and perhaps not even a dungeon item. The entire goal would revolve around getting your equipment back and finding a way to escape. Like the Forsaken Fortress, a dungeon like this would be centered all around stealth and evasion at first, until you find your stuff so you can fight back. Aquatic freshness, Lionese mapping, and Mask Majora all seem to have a profound love for flying cities. And while we have seen something like this in the form of the city in the sky, this one is a callback to what is, in my opinion, the best location in Skyward Sword, that being Skyloft. God only knows what happened to Skyloft after the events of Skyward Sword. We never see this place again, and if we are to believe the story of the game, the ones who used to live there settled down on the surface and never returned. There's plenty of theories about it. Some make the argument that the city in the sky is Skyloft, others tie it to the Palace of Winds in Minish Cap, but none of this has ever been proven without a doubt. If Skyloft was abandoned for millennia, it would be amazing to revisit it after all this time in the form of a dungeon. In a way, it's a bit similar to the dungeon town idea, but I still had to include it because, come on, it's Skyloft, the origin point of the Zelda chronology. Remember how in Metal Gear Solid 4 you could go back to Shadow Moses after four games and it's in a state of complete decay? Something like that. A nostalgia trip back to an old location. Now, this is a very interesting one by Timothy Odd. In a way, it sounds similar to the idea of Link projecting himself outside of his body, like we talked about in the Sacred Realm dungeon, but there's a catch. These projections of Link are in two dimensions rather than three. And I'm not talking about the wall merging from a Link Between Worlds. As cool as that mechanic was, it was pretty limited in what you could do with it. A better comparison would be the 8-bit sections from Mario Odyssey, where you can actually jump, attack, and have full range of motion in two dimensions. Timothy also mentioned that this dungeon could be tied to the Sheikah technology, where Link scans himself into a machine and is then projected into a 2D environment. These sections could serve as puzzles to open doors, for instance. Finishing a 2D challenge would then allow you to advance further into the dungeon. Whether this is a side-scroller like Mario Odyssey or Zelda 2, or top-down, I will leave up to you to decide. But hey, Nintendo already made a 2D prototype of Breath of the Wild during development, so maybe a good way to put that to use? Libraries are inherently mysterious. All the knowledge kept in these places, the smell of old books, the silence. So what would be more amazing than a huge, abandoned, ancient library to explore? That is exactly what Paper Sonic, Sir Nicholas and Noah Thurston propose. Paper Sonic makes the comparison to the 10th episode, fittingly titled The Library, from one of my favorite series of all time, Avatar The Last Airbender. Here, Aang and his friends stumble across an enormous, ancient, largely abandoned library in the middle of the desert. Sir Nicholas describes a Hogwarts-esque environment, with moving staircases, whiz ropes, flying book enemies, and a mini-boss in the form of an old man or creature on a sliding bookshelf ladder who bombards Link with books. 
Very creative in my book, pun intended. Noah 2 describes an old, rundown library filled with darkness, cobwebs and monsters. Though in this case they make a connection to Low Rule, and even suggest that we play as Ravio instead of Link. A great idea if we ever get a spin-off of A Link Between Worlds. And lastly, I also wanted to include an idea from Yaibini Thousand, who wants to see a dungeon that revolves around reading an ancient language, perhaps Zonai or some other forgotten language. And well, what better location to do something like that than in an ancient library? Library. Furthermore, they also make the suggestion that the main item of the dungeon would be something akin to the Book of Madura, and I love that idea. After all, not every dungeon item has to be a weapon or an item that gives you more mobility. A mysterious book, which you can use to decipher ancient texts both in the dungeon itself and in later parts of the game is also very satisfying. The last time we saw something like this in a Zelda game was the Ancient Sky Book in Twilight Princess, which was criminally underused. Something more close to the Book of Madura from A Link to the Past would be amazing, as here it was used multiple times throughout the adventure. In a way, the Divine Beasts already took some light inspiration from steampunk, but Zelda has never gone all the way with this. And while I'm conflicted whether or not Zelda should go full steampunk someday, we could at least start with a dungeon in this popular style. 10,000 subscribers with one video, great name by the way, refers to Stovepipe Island, which was an unused island concept from the Wind Waker that never made it into the final game. They pitched the idea of a steam-powered robot boss, which can be defeated by destroying pipes, and ultimately the dungeon experience results in an escape sequence where the dungeon floods with water. John Pro too likes the idea of a steampunk inspired Zelda dungeon, and refers to an amazing piece of fan art made by Dave Song. And while again I'm not sure about Ganondorf being the central figure in this, I do like the idea of a rich, maniacal host who stands in the way of Link and possibly Zelda as well. They also bring up the idea of a steam train where you fight from wagon to wagon, kinda like a gauntlet or combat trial if you will. In turn, Benno also seems to have a thing for trains, it seems, and refers to a Spirit Tracks inspired dungeon. One where you progress by expanding the rail system inside the dungeon to access new areas. Something that would fit a steampunk environment. Breath of the Wild introduced a rich and complex chemistry engine, and with it came the power of electricity as well. And while we already saw electricity being used to solve puzzles inside the shrines and some of the divine beasts, I think the Zelda team only scratched the surface when it comes to the possibilities. As such, Fallen Saber would like to see this idea turned into a full dungeon concept rather than some of the scattered micro-challenges. And I fully agree. One of the most fun aspects of this element was how flexible it was, and how it allowed you to cheat the system a lot of times. Imagine a giant power plant where, as Saber suggests, the main goal is to transfer electricity from one place to another on a large scale. An interconnected web which all works together and influences the dungeon as a whole. Enemies could be defeated by using the electricity to your advantage and set traps for them. A bit like the plasmids from Bioshock 1 and 2. The ultimate goal would be to restore power to the main door leading to the boss, which in Fallen Saber's idea could be a reintroduced version of the Armos Knights from A Link to the Past. A central knight covered in an electric barrier connected and surrounded by smaller knights who need to be defeated first in order to disperse the barrier. Which also kinda reminds me of Baronade from Ocarina of Time, where you first had to get rid of the electric jellyfish before you could take on the brain. After all the smaller knights are defeated, Link would then face off with the central knight in a dark nut type of duel, combined with projectiles, electric beams and more craziness to deal with. So do I, Mark. Thus, a Zelda dungeon in space? Yes, please. And Chris Pork, Jared Whedon, Acronym Animations, Dan Rowland, and Camden Anderson all feel the same way too. I think a dungeon in the form of a space station would work very well. Not only has it never been done before in a Zelda game thematically, but I'm also confident that the Zelda team can devise some excellent puzzles. Think rooms with zero gravity platforming and puzzle elements, a bit like the ones we found in Dead Space. We've already experienced walking on walls and ceilings in Twilight Princess, and as cool as that was, it was a bit sluggish at times. Now imagine this, but in zero gravity and with Breath of the Wild's mobility. It would also be amazing to finally see the planet where the series takes place on in its full glory. Maybe we'll be able to spot some secret continents out there outside of Hyrule too. The highest we've ever been in the franchise is above the clouds in both Twilight Princess 
Princess and Skyward Sword, and I am all in for taking it up even higher to the edge of space. I mean, it's not like the idea of spaceships is completely foreign to the Zelda team either. As Camden Anderson points out, we had the aliens from Majora's Mask, which almost certainly came with the spaceship. We've also seen concept art from Breath of the Wild involving an enormous mothership invading Hyrule, so why not take us for a trip to the stars for a unique dungeon experience? Malice. It's one of the main themes in Breath of the Wild and can be found in almost every corner of the map. A remnant of Calamity Ganon's attack on Hyrule 100 years ago. And it seems that for the sequel we will see this hate-fueled substance return in some shape or form, as seen from the E3 trailer. Faran says that he would love to see a Malice-themed dungeon, one where you have to get rid of the Malice as you advance from floor to floor. And I think this could definitely work. We've already seen Malice being used as a way to obstruct Link's progression, like in Hyrule Castle or some of the Labyrinths. We've also seen Malice-based enemies in Age of Calamity, which could make a comeback or completely new enemies based on this concept. Quinn Wood's idea is a bit different, but also pitches the idea of an item capable of getting rid of malice, which in a dungeon like this could work as a progression item. At first, large parts of the dungeon could be rendered inaccessible due to the Ganon goop. Okay, that just sounds wrong. Anyway, obtaining this item or ability would fully open up the dungeon and you're good to go. Quinn also suggests a sort of malice sludge monster as the final boss, one which obviously would have to be defeated by utilizing your malice cleaning tool slash ability. Now here's an idea that definitely hasn't been done before in the Zelda series. A dungeon island. Kate Fallon makes the comparison to Eventide Island, which was already a fan favorite side quest. So to see something like this return but in a bigger, more dungeon-like form would definitely be amazing. Furthermore, just like with Eventide, you could either lose all of your stuff altogether and have to clear the dungeon using only the items you can find on the island, or you lose all your stuff and you have to go get them back one by one by exploring the island, battling enemies, and solving puzzles. We've seen sort of a similar scenario in Oracle of Ages, where Link gets stranded on an island and the natives steal all of his equipment. But here, getting them back was more or less a glorified trading sequence. Anonymous Monkey adds an extra touch to the idea of an island-based dungeon, turning it from one island into a group of islands, i.e. an archipelago instead. Link would then be able to travel between the different islands through all sorts of different means, whether it's finding or constructing a raft, climbing to a high place and paragliding to the next island, or perhaps some islands could be connected by bridges. The sea surrounding the islands could potentially be turbulent and dangerous due to a storm, preventing Link from simply swimming from one island to the next. M. Knox does his name justice and came up with a Hylian version of Fort Knox, a sort of secret vault perhaps tied to the royal family where all sorts of secrets are stored. Knox points out some of the DLC items as an example, which are said to have been stolen from within Hyrule Castle somewhere. I really like the idea of a dungeon tied to the royal family, as it could give a different spin on the dangers Link has to overcome. A dungeon like this could for example incorporate enemies and obstacles which are not inherently evil, but are instead simply part of the security systems of of the vault. Robotic guards, laser traps, and other security measures Link has to either avoid or deactivate. Think a bit like the guardians from Skyward Sword found in the Silent Realm sections. Not evil or malicious, but still nerve-wracking once they start coming for you. Simon Halen also weighs in on this idea, a dungeon primarily based on stealth and evasion, also a bit like the Yiga clan hideout and the Forsaken Fortress, which I think fits perfectly with the idea Nox presented. The goal of a dungeon like this could be to retrieve some sort of ancient artifact one which the royal family had hidden away inside their vaults and is necessary to advance the main plot. Who here likes clowns? Nobody, right? Clowns are creepy F, so what would be more awesome than whacking a clown across the face with the Master Sword? A creative name and I am, again, great names guys, both came up with the idea of a carnival or funhouse type of dungeon. Mario already had the privilege of visiting a theme park, twice actually, so now it's Link's turn. And not just any carnival, a dark and creepy carnival, preferably one set during nighttime to get those colorful lights shining bright. Obviously, again, because I'm a Silent Hill nerd, one of the first things that came to my mind was the Lakeside Amusement Park from Silent Hill. For Zelda, probably not as dark and the 
disturbing as this one, but you know, it goes without saying that with a carnival type of dungeon you could do so many different things since, well, it's a theme park. Haunted houses, a ferris wheel, roller coasters, all sorts of ways to spice up the gameplay. And as I am suggests, a boss fight with a giant jester or clown type of monster. Perhaps even while riding a roller coaster, which immediately makes me think of Mario Sunshine. You can never go wrong with pirates in my book, and Andrew Allred and Silver Shadow seem to feel the same way. Now, this is not necessarily a new idea. We already had a pirate fortress in Majora's Mask, and of course the sand ship in Skyward Sword. But this is one theme I wouldn't mind being revisited again in a different form. Especially since the pirate fortress in Majora's Mask didn't really feel like a pirate themed dungeon, at least not in the classical sense. And aside from the fight with the robot pirate captain, even the sand ship felt more like a technology type of dungeon. Where was the rum? the sea shanties and the treasures. One idea I really like would be an underwater dungeon, perhaps a sunken pirate ship or a pirate stronghold at the bottom of the ocean. One which, as Silver Shadow suggests, could be infested with undead Stalfos pirates. You know what I'm talking about, like the first pirates of the Caribbean. Andrew and Silver both have plenty of ideas. Themes of treasure, whirlpools, a boss captain who plays the organ like Davy Jones, you can go all out with this. Pirates are awesome, thus another pirate themed dungeon would be awesome too. Jump on Everything, Greg Amlin, Syphy and Master Spongebad all came up with a similar idea which I think would be amazing. An ancient abandoned Sheikah factory slash laboratory. We've seen plenty of different guardian types in Breath of the Wild, but where did they actually come from? Well, we know that the Sheikah built them, but how? I'd be hesitant to think that they built them by hand, right? Plus, in Skyward Sword we've seen that the Sheikah also had a factory type of facility, with conveyor belts and robots who were mining time shift crystals. So what if there's a long forgotten Sheikah factory in Hyrule, perhaps underground or inside a mountain or something like that? A place where the guardians were made, and where we could see unseen prototypes which never got finished in time. This way Nintendo Nintendo could introduce brand new guardian types never before seen. An even more awesome addition to this overall idea comes from Jump on Everything, who suggests a sort of mother computer or central unit who controls the entire facility and has gone haywire, which immediately makes me think of GLaDOS from Portal, or the autopilot from WALL-E. As the factory was abandoned, the central unit became self-aware and continued to keep the facility operational. As such, this central computer nor the guardians it controls are infested with malice. The mother computer simply developed a mind of its own and deems anyone trespassing or trying to shut the lab down as a threat to its existence. This computer would have complete control of the facility and eyes everywhere, continuing to try to attack Link by sending guardians after him, obstructing his path and so on. As for the aesthetics, I really like the idea from Craig Amlin. An architecture similar to that of the Sheikah Shrine since it's based on the same technology, but overgrown with moss, vines and ivy, giving it a sort of post-apocalyptic feel. A factory which has been abandoned for 10,000 years, yet is still desperately kept up and running by its central computer. Now this one is a very creative idea, brought forth by David P. A color dungeon. Link's Awakening had a color dungeon, but that was mostly based on the fact that the Game Boy Color could finally display, well, uh, color, which was a big deal back then. But aside from that, this dungeon was nothing special, and mostly just an excuse to showcase puzzles which can be solved due to the fact that you can now see the color of the switches, tiles, levers, etc. What David suggests is way more creative. A dungeon that starts out completely black and white when you first enter, kinda like Hyrule Castle in The Wind Waker. But as you progress through the dungeon, you bring back its original palette one color at a time. So say you conquer one part of the dungeon. All the parts that are red, for example, are now visible. Because you can now see that color, this then allows you to solve specific puzzles. Uh, for instance, one door will only open if you manage to match a grid with red tiles, which you would only be able to solve if the color red is visible. As you progress, more colors are restored, and hence you can solve more and more puzzles, some which require two colors visible, three, four, and so on.
Remember when Phantom Ganon came in and out of paintings in Ocarina of Time? Well, how about a dungeon based on this concept? Which is something not a friendly name came up with. Something like a house or a weird mansion filled with paintings which Link can enter. Obviously for many this calls back to Mario 64, but unlike that game where each painting is a whole world, here it would be on a smaller scale, where each painting functions as a single dungeon room instead. And the aesthetics of these rooms can depend on the art style of the painting. So one room can look like a black and white sketch, and the other can have a watercolor look to it, and so on, granting a wide variety of aesthetics for this dungeon. And mechanically the options are endless. One painting could be unfinished, for example, and you need to somehow fill in the rest. Some paintings may be hidden away in a chest somewhere, and Link has to find it and hang it on a wall somewhere so he can enter it. Which is a nice and different take on the lock and key concept. Instead of collecting keys, you are literally collecting new rooms to explore. Ever since the trailer for Breath of the Wild sequel, speculation about the possibility of a playable Zelda has been running rampant, and for good reason. Two-player co-op or even switching between two different characters for long periods of time has never been done in a 3D Zelda title. As such, Storewise Boss 69, Face Ponage WTF, Ivan Anaya, and La Belle Dame du Manoir would all like to see a dungeon where you can swap between Link and Zelda. And La Belle Dame makes a good reference to a past game. Some of you may remember Seikan's hide out from the Anju and Cafe side quest in Majora's Mask, which as far as I can remember was the first time that you could take control of a character other than Link, however brief it may be. Later in The Wind Waker we also had Medley and Makar, which could also be controlled on a room to room basis. But please god, make switching between characters less of an ordeal than it was here. Storewide boss envisions a boss fight where Link and Zelda fight together, with each using their unique abilities to fight. Face Ponage proposes a dueling peaks dungeon, where Link and the other character, presumably Zelda, enter the dungeon on opposite sides of the peaks. From here they both have to overcome their own challenges until one of them runs into a roadblock. Then you switch to the other character and clear their section, and so on. Until finally the two meet at the boss room for the final challenge. Ivan makes it even more interesting, and suggests that the dungeon could be split into two different time periods, and either Link or Zelda is in the past while the other is in the present. Which would make for some mind-boggling puzzles, where one character changes something that affects the other time period. Lastly, we have Legend Zone and their idea for a dungeon located on an incredibly large creature i.e. Leviathan. Of course, in some ways the Divine Beasts were already like this, but as big as they were, I think that not only can we go bigger, but instead of a mechanical beast, it's an actual living being like the Titans from Xenoblade Chronicles 2. We have been on the backs of giant organic creatures before, but never in a dungeon setting. Of course, this beast would have to be pretty massive, and could be moving around Hyrule, either flying around or maybe even swimming underwater. Legend Zone says that the beast could be infested with a parasite, one which Link needs to slowly chip away at by destroying parts of it as you progress until it's finally dead. Think the city in the sky from Twilight Princess crossed with the Leviathan and Bilocide battle from Skyward Sword. And with that we have reached the end of the list. But before we close the curtains I'd feel bad if I didn't at least do some honorable mentions. I want to start by highlighting Sharpshooter Zigbar, Dr. Pudis and Patrick Acock's ideas. These are all extremely long and detailed. They basically describe an entire dungeon experience from beginning to end, including the setting, items, specific puzzles and even dialogue. They were too extensive to include here, since I would have had to oversimplify them way too much. So instead I will make a community post, where you can read them in full detail. Detail. So if you're interested, be sure to give them a read, as they are very creative. Next we have Patrick Kuhn and their idea for a fairy dungeon, Lois Georgescu, who came up with a dungeon idea inside Link's head, so basically a dream dungeon, Julia Sensina's Doggo dungeon, where you need to save dogs from a demon cat, Lemmy the Cool, a fire dungeon which is frozen at first and is progressively restored as you make your way through, Luke Wilson TV who suggested a dungeon inside the belly of a big Goron, Ella West and their idea for a dungeon companion who joins you and then at the end turns out to be evil, and Waterbear08 who had a similar idea to Lewis, a mental dungeon inside Link's own mind. And that is all for now. I just want to say thank you to everyone who submitted their idea, whether it made it on the list or not. It was a lot of fun reading them and I got all sorts of inspiration from it. And of course a huge, huge thanks to Ganon Doodles for their amazing work. I will put any links to their social media and other stuff in the description and the pinned comment below, so you can 
can check out even more artwork. These were just sketches, so you can imagine how good the real stuff is. And lastly, thank you to anyone who followed my content or supported the channel in any way in the past year. And here's to many more years ahead of us. My voice is just completely gone at this point. So if you guys don't mind, I will do the Patreon and member shoutouts next week. I'm gonna need some rest. See you all next time. This is Don signing off and <gasps> have a good one.